Thank you. Welcome to this West of London Astronomical Society meeting. If you expected to go to another meeting, leave now. <laughs> but, uh, we are um, welcome, de delighted to see you all here. It's a return to fairly good uh, attendance at our meetings and uh, it's nice to see everyone here. Our speaker tonight is Steve Tonkin, who's driven all the way up from Dorset, as we say. And he, is, he has many strings to his bow. He is an author of books on astronomy and in particular, as, as far as we're concerned tonight, on binocular observing, hence the title, Two Eyes Are Better Than One. He is also the dark sky advisor for the Cranbourne Chase AONB, the Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty, which is, occupies a large area of Wiltshire and Dorset. And he, Steve's job uh, for, for that is to go around, I, 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 I kidded him, saying a bit like the ARP warden in Dad's Army, put that light out! But he doesn't quite do that. Yeah, he, a few people it, have called me Hodges. <laughs> they do call you Hodges. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, so he is trying to um, make sure that the, the, the dark sky area is as dark as can be, and maybe we will visit it at some time ourselves. So that's something to look forward to, and Dorset is a great place to visit. So, two eyes are better than one. One speaker is better than two. So I hand over to Steve. <laughs> Thanks. I apologise for the delay. Um, so it was uh, an interesting journey. <laughs> so over um, about the next hour, what I'd like to do is go through, um, first of all, why use binoculars. If you're going to use them, what do you choose? Um, and probably more importantly, what you avoid and what you not believe in advertising hype. Um, because there's some really good binoculars that are dirt cheap almost, and there are so, some absolute rubbish, some of which I will demonstrate, which is quite expensive. Um, and then what to observe. It's, it don't, it's not going to be a list. I'm, I get as bored by the lists as just about anybody else does. Um, so it's a few examples and then also how to find out where you can get the information from of yourself because as I say li lists are tedious. So let's kick off. Why binoculars? Well certainly when I started out in astronomy I actually started with binoculars. My dad handed me his binoculars which were about this big. I was seven years old. This was the 4th of October 1957. So if you remember what happened the day before, it was Sputnik launch. Um, oh, we, we can leave the lights on for the most. Um, we'll pop them off when showing stuff of the night sky, but yeah. Um, so I tried to follow these heavy binoculars steady, but I was absolutely knocked out by what I could see. Um, so this was pristine African skies, so yeah, I was lucky. But if you read just about any astronomy book from probably from about the 1940s onwards, it always says start out with binoculars. And so why? Well, they're an excellent beginner's instrument because they're so easy to use. I mean, how long does it take you know, to get, the, get them out of their case, flip the caps off, put the strap around your neck, unless you want to... Um, subsidise the binocular repairers, they love people who don't use straps, and then get them up to your eyes. I mean, how long does that take? So there's, they're really useful from that point of view. Uh, good habit to get into, if you put binoculars down, eyepieces up, always put the covers on, otherwise you just accumulate dust and get scratched. Okay, but they're also an excellent serious instrument. Um, that up there, for example, is clearly not a beginner's instrument. It's essentially a couple of almost couple of spotting scopes next to each other. And the, you know, if, if you remember the year before Comet Hale Bop, there was Comet Hyakutake, <coughs> which Yuji Hyakutake. Uh, Japanese astronomer discovered even bigger than that. I'll show you a picture of that sort of thing later. Um, and the reason they're good for these things is they're generally they're portable. 
I mean, even that lot, normally I can, if I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's a nice clear sky, I can get that lot set up in my garden, usually within 10 or 15 minutes and be observing. So the easy setup is really important. And certainly, we just think of the weather since over the last few months. Looking at my observing logs, the last time I opened my observatory for serious observing was the 6th of February. Which, you know, you, you go out observing with, with friends and, you know, a lot of them are doing imaging and that, so they're setting up the equatorial mount and they're getting everything sorted out. And, you know, about an hour later, they're just about ready to go and the cloud comes over and the rain falls down. They've packed up, I've been observing for 45 minutes already. So, it's useful. And then there's the binocular advantage. And say, well, what is a binocular advantage? And it is quite simply times 1.4. And this applies effectively to um, very, very faint objects. Objects that are at the, at the limit of your, of your observing threshold. And what it means is that if you're observing through two apertures, so in this case, two 50 mil apertures, it's equivalent to observing through a single aperture for detecting faint things, which is one of the uh, 1.4 times the diameter, uh, because we're using two eyes, really. This is, this is what it's all about. Um, so, so a two, a 50 millimeter binocular will get you about as faint as a 70 millimeter single telescope. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is called statistical summation, which is quite simply, if you've got two detectors, you have uh, an increased probability of detection, the very faint stuff is. <coughs> Excuse me. But you've also got what's called physiological summation. Any images here? <coughs> you call it stacking. Okay? Essentially, what you, you, you've got two um, pathways to your visual cortex, where it's, it's all put together, and having two inputs to it, it reduces the signal-to-noise ratio. It's exactly like stacking images. So you, you're increasing, improving the signal and decreasing the, the noise ratio. And this, and you could actually try this for yourself. If you put something that you can, at a distance where you can just read it with two eyes open, and then close an eye, doesn't matter which one. You can't read it anymore. You know, this, is, this is the sort of thing we get, we're getting there. And then you've got things like <coughs> false stereopsis. I mean, things that are light years away, of course they, we, can't, we don't see them in 3D. But it looks like it. And if visual observing can't be enjoyable and pleasurable because it, goes, Look, it looks nice, then why do it? Uh, and then the other thing I'll be talking about, I've never been able to do this, but I'm assured it's um, a thing, is the negation of your blind spot. So if, you, if something is falling on the blind spot of one eye, that's where your optic nerve comes into the back of your retina, it cannot be falling on the blind spot of the other eye. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've, never, so I've never managed to get that, but I'm told by people who know a lot better than I, that's the thing. So, that's an introduction to, at least, to how we can, um, why, why we should consider binoculars. So what sort of thing binoculars we get? Well, the first type is the Poro prism binocular, which is this sort of thing. It's um, <coughs> detectable by its stepped shape, for reasons that will become obvious in a moment. And the other type is your roof prism which look as though they're straight through. Let's get that off there. These little things, by the way, which I've put on all my binoculars, at least I did before the price went through the roof, are called bino bandits. And they're, and they're really great. I'll show you why later. So they look as though they're straight through. They're not, but... That's, so that's your really two major classes. I like to add a third one, which is things with angled eyepieces like that one up there, because that is a, a completely different wall game. Okay, so this is what poros look like. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. 
excuse me. So what you have is light coming in here, through this lens here, and your eyepiece is there. If this was just an ordinary astronomical telescope, what you'd get is an inverted, reversed image out of here. So you have two prisms in there at right angles to each other. One turns the image the right way around, the other one turns it the right way up. The other thing it does is it folds the light path, which means that your instrument becomes much more compact. Because the longer it is, the more unwieldy it gets, the more likely you are to damage it, the more difficult it is to mount, um, and just about everything else <laughs> that could possibly go wrong is likely to go wrong with it. So, you know, the folded light path is a good idea. So its advantages is, as far as bang for your bucks goes, it is usually the best quality in any given price range will be a Porro. Um, and I'll explain why when we get onto roofs. And they're relatively easy to maintain. I'm quite happy to strip down one of these things and put it back together, you know, um, like I've just inherited one recently, which is a, ve a very nice one, but it's been badly abused. So it will be stripped down, clean, put back together, and sold for charity. All right. Disadvantages, for the same size, they're bulkier and heavier, and the cheap ones easily lose collimation. Collimation binoculars doesn't mean the same as it means in telescopes. Mm -hmm. Collimation binoculars means having your two images in exactly the same place in the field of view. And it's very, very easy on the very, very cheap ones. This is an example up here. Just look at it too hard. It seems like one of the prism slips and two images for the price of one. But I'll get them straight. I will, I'll show you something. You can see it with yourself a bit later. OK. And then the roofs, well, they look like that. They look as though they're straight through. But they've got this roof prism here. What is this? It's actually two prisms which serve exactly the same purpose as the prisms in the Poro prism, turn the image the right way round and invert it, and also it folds the light path. So you've got a fairly complicated light path here, but it looks like it's straight through. So its advantages of the, uh, it's a heck of a lot lighter and a heck of a lot more compact, which can be a consideration depending on what you're doing. Just pop those back on that. And they're much easier to waterproof. Now, if we go back to you're not going to do it, are you? No, it doesn't want to. Never mind. Um, Focusing in this is done by an internal lens, which moves backwards and forwards. The focusing in one of these is usually done by moving the eyepieces up and down. Now that is somewhere where water can get in. Now these are waterproof, and they've, they've got slight focus lags. There's little O-ring seals in there. And they just sort of lag it a little bit, but it makes them waterproof, so yes, you know, trade-offs really. And focus on something like this isn't absolutely critical. Disadvantages are they're much more expensive. That roof prism has to be figured round to the, the shape has to be 90, 90 times more precise than the angles in a roof prism, in a, in a poro prism, and precision costs. They're also much more difficult to self-maintain. I don't bother. If I need them done, I usually get my roof prism binoculars from um, Opticron. Brilliant after-sales service. I just send them back and they sort it for me. Nice one. If you don't want to use Opticron, there's a great place down in Celsi called Opt-Rep, Optical Repairs. Uh, does a great job on binos. But the aperture is also limited by this straight, see, straight through design. And that is because if you imagine you've got something this size, the nearest the eyepieces can be if it's straight through is the diameter of that, which in that case is 100 millimeters. Your eyes aren't 100 millimeters apart. So really with roof prisms, 
unless we do something else, and there are ways of doing it, we're limited to about 50 millimetre aperture, which is great, fine for astronomy, but you might want more. Okay, and then the angled eyepiece is like that. There's a, um, a lens in there which puts the light through the angle, because that's great, because it's much more comfortable to use. If I want to look at something up there, it's like that. If I want to look at something up there with something like this, well, you can imagine it's like that. <laughs> and, you know, see the physio in the morning. Okay. Um, but they're much more expensive. That extra bit of glass, if it's not going to degrade the image, has to be really, really good quality. So, quality adds price. And they have to be mounted. The normal way of finding something with a binocular is to look at it with, in the sky, uh, where you don't have like you know, terrestrial stuff, you've got horizons, you've got references you can go by. Sky you generally don't, at least initially, is look at whatever it is you're going to look at and just put the binoculars in the way. That works. And if you can't see it, go up because you're almost certainly too low. You can't do it with that. So they, they do need to be mounted so that you can point them in the right direction. And that means they also need some species of finder which is what that there is. It's a little reflex finder. Projects the image of a couple of red circles onto the sky. It's like, like a Telrad, only I think better. Telrads are incredibly good. Probably the best dew detector humanity <laughs> managed to uh, you know, see people who've got Telrads here. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, binoculars. Described by two numbers. So it's magnification by the aperture of the big end in millimetres. Uh, I should also mention other binoculars as well, actually. These came with a Secrets of the Universe fact file. They came, I'll pass them around. They look like they're roof prisms, they're not. They are little Galilean binoculars. They're, they're basically little opera glass glasses. They give you an incredibly narrow field of view. I've seen all four moons of Jupiter with these. So, 8x40, or in this case 8x42, I've got a dozen of these, identical, for doing outreach with youngsters, because then I know exactly what they're looking at, and what they can see, and I can see the same thing. And you can get them going quickly because, you know, you can imagine what it's like with a group of eight-year-olds, they don't want to spend ten minutes being told how to use the thing. Um, but anybody, really, can hold something like this steady. They're not that little seven-year-old me struggling with something my dad's big Zeister Karams, um, trying to see Sputnik, which we didn't see anyway. Well, we thought we did. Found out later we didn't. We saw the blooming booster rocket that took it up there. <laughs> well, I found out later. So anybody can do that without even being taught how to hold the things properly. So that's... Uh, um, you know, I'll pass this round from the other end. Right. Uh, there you go. Um, I'll ask you if you've got my binos going around, please can you try not to touch the try to touch the, the optics. Okay. So never never a good idea. Okay. Um, Ten by fifty, that's this size. Most people can learn to handhold. When my, I'll show you later, but when my son was 10 years old, I showed him what I thought was a good way of hand holding these things, and he actually managed to, Dad, I found something, what is it? Don't know, it's a cluster of stars, okay, where is it? And he devised a star hop to show me, he made a completely independent discovery of the um, open cluster M34. <laughs> but, now that, that just tells me that if he can do that, he's using them effectively. And so, you know, somebody 10 years old can be taught to do, to do that properly. Then 15 by 70, that's the one up there on that little parallelogram. Um, you can handhold them for a bit, or this size, this is a 16 by 70, it's a bit bigger and heavier. You can handhold these just about, 
for a little bit, but actually, it's all particularly if they're quality ones, it's a waste of money. You really want to mount them, but there are ways of doing that. And then anything bigger must be mounted. Yes, you do get the he-men who say, yes, I can hold 25 by 100. Yeah, yeah, well, I can hold them as well, but you're all, all over the place. So what size do you want? This would be a good time to have the lights out if possible. Or if you tell me where to switch, I'll do it myself when I need to. Great. So what we've got here, um, we're actually using this for comparison. Now, all these night sky images I show, they are not photographs and they are not drawings. They are simulations. So basically I use Plantarian program, get up the, uh, the image it gives us something, and then and you use uh, the GIMP, you know, well, most people use Photoshop, I guess, to make it look like what I see. So from my um, back garden, which is, if you know your bottle scale, it's, it's bottle four, apparently. Um, I don't really do bottle scale. But it's a, a reasonably dark suburban back garden. Um, that's the cluster M35 in Gemini. So that's what I can see with 10 by 50s. 15 by 70s, that's the difference. And then the big brutes, 37 by 100, quite a lot of difference. But light pollution really makes a difference. So if we're thinking of the, compare the 10 by 50 to the hundreds up there, that's my back garden. I do a heck of a lot of outreach down on the south coast, like Bournemouth. <laughs> but notice you can see stuff in the big ones that you can't see in the little ones there. Um, light, light pollution is a killer. It, it really is. But you go somewhere dark. And it's very, very different. This is, this is why we need to get rid of it. This is what I grew up under. So when I see this, I think this is rubbish. And actually, it's pretty good for a lot of the UK. In fact, it's, it's better than anything you'll get in London. Not, not, not London at all. Um, but you, you know that anyway. Other things to notice in this is that actually, as you increase the aperture, your sky back, uh, the, sorry, the magnification, because we're increasing the magnification by a greater percentage than we're increasing the light gathering, your sky background's getting darker, so you're getting better contrast, and that's one thing you can, you can do. So, you know, people say, oh, you should always have a five millimeter exit, people. Well, no, you shouldn't. Um, with that, 2.3 millimeter, and it's perfect for me. Okay. Uh, can we have the lights back on again, please? Sorry. Sorry, this is going to be, well, I'll try and do too much of this. So how do we hold them? You can, you can try this. Yeah. Great. If you put that joint of your thumb, you find it fits perfectly in the corner of your eye. Mm. It's ever so comfy. Okay. And you can use that as the basis for holding binoculars for looking up. Now, if you're looking horizontally, the, best, the, the worst way to hold binoculars almost all the time is the way everybody holds them, which is like that. Okay. Horizontal, do it the way the American military teach you, because you hold them by the big ends, like so. But if you hold them, if you're looking up, the problem is you've now taken a lot of weight on your arms, your arms are higher than your heart, so your blood supply is reduced, and the result of your blood supply being reduced, they start to ache, and then you get the shakes, and it's just horrible. If you learn to do this, it's so much easier. You just hold two fingers around here, thumbs in your eye, and you're up like that, as my dear wife is demonstrating on the screen, and then that gives you a stable triangle, 
If you're lying back, even if you're not lying back, your head's helping to support the weight, and it feels, I'm going to drop them. You won't. But if, until you get used to it, it feels like you will. And then there, um, it's just a heck of a lot more stable, and it becomes second nature after a while. Um, I'll whip the bino bandits off so they're easier to use without the bino bandits. I'll pass those to the back, heat at the back and start off with something to do, and give it a go. Strap round your neck, please, folks. Right. Um, this is why they're called bino bandits. So that's holding them. You can also just use just about anything. Um, one of the things I love about doing talks like this, I've said another thing you do, if you try using golf visors, well no, I don't play golf, so I try it with my cricket cap. Just hold them to the peak of your cap, steadies them, anything works like that. People say, put them on a tripod. No. Imagine if these were here. I want to look at something up there. Now, we've never got this universe of infinite space-time, yeah? So why is it that when you do that, you always have five legs competing for the same little snippet of it? <laughs> now, you say, down there, you're going to be kicking the tripod, the knocking in here, you're getting under it, it's just a pain. You really need not to put them on a tripod like that, unless you're looking at something no higher than about 25, 30 degrees up. You can see how awkward it gets there. Okay. Patrick Moore used to recommend these, called a neck pod, which is really rather a silly name for it, because it's um, it's not. It's a, it's like a little monopod that rests on your sternum. It's okay. The only problem is it proves that you're alive, <laughs> because what you see is your pups. <laughs> Um, or the monopod. This is my version of bliss with binoculars. What, what did I do with it? Here. So, this hardly add, adds to the bulk of what you're carrying around. Make sure that's on and properly. And You can use it sitting, you can use it reclining. With a trigger grip head like this, you can basically look anywhere. Oh, eye pieces are getting lower. Never mind, I'll just increase that height of that a little bit. And it's lovely. If you're going to have a play with this later, um, just be a little bit careful. Don't have your face anywhere near it when you're learning to use a trigger grip. Because if it gets you on the bridge of the nose, it hurts. Um, guess how I know. <laughs> So, and that is beautifully portable. With this setup here, I can see loads. Um, I did most of a Messier marathon with it um, last year, just to see if I could. Lovely. Messier marathon is when you see child Messiers, or when you can't see more from Britain anyway, but uh, see as many as you can. They're fun. Well, I'll put these out for people to have a, a, just to play with nature if they wish to. And I say nothing that I hand out has the words do not touch, <coughs> do not touch on them. But the bliss way to do it is with um, a parallelogram mount. Because the thing about a parallelogram mount <coughs> is this. If I'm looking at something here, one I'm not getting involved with the, with the tripod. But secondly, and gather I do a fair bit of outreach, I can drop this to the eye height of a youngster, and it's still pointing at the same thing. Yeah. It's absolutely gorgeous for that. Now, the, um, people ask, can you get cheap? Because those, well, those aren't made anymore, and they, they weren't cheap. But that set up there which I bought in 2003, so 20 years. I'm down, I, I did for up until, oh, for about the first 10, 12 years. I actually added up the amount of time I'd used with it. 
and I was down to single single digit pence per hour, which I reckon is pretty good. Um, cheap monopods, there were some, but they now the cheap ones you can get are rubbish. This is not in, sorry, uh, parallelograms. The this is not intended as a parallelogram. This is a newer camera crane. This thing extends out to about here. The idea is you put a camera on it and you can hoist it up and look at things and that. But a few of us have been experimenting with these things and they make really nice for you know, sort of smallish weight binoculars. They make really nice little parallelograms. Um, this one I've just put a, a little wall head on so that can so it's, it's so you can you know if anybody wants to use a newer camera crane I can sh point you to the thread on which we discussed it and there's a chap in um, Italy who's made some real improvements to it so he's he could he's ho hoisting some pretty heavy binoculars on the same thing and that's sort of worked with a cheap Amazon tripod which is a heck of a lot better than a lot but parallelograms are great because not only can you have you know, yourself and a child sharing the views, you can also decide whether, without moving the tripod, the, the tripod has not moved at all between that and that. Do I want to observe standing? Sometimes I like to. Do I want to lie down on a recliner? Sometimes I like to. And you can do both. And it's just, it's so convenient. So, but you don't have to go to this expense. You can use just about anything to steady yourself. You know, fences, trees, car bonnets. Um, in this case here, um, you can, this is a, this is a deluxe version of this. This is a cheap monopod. So it's, it's a four quid window cleaning squeegee jo job. Okay. <laughs> With a cranked head, so it holds the vertical bit, which actually doesn't have to be vertical. Um, a bit sort of proud of astronomer's belly. Um, or here's a cheap little beach chair using an elbow rest or hooking your fingers over it. Deluxe version here, swivel chair, you know, sort of freedom of movement and azimuth. Or you can go to the other extreme. That's called a star chair. Uh, it was invented in Australia. So I'd show you a picture of the binoculars that Yuji Hakutagi made, use for his comet discovery. It's those. 25 by 150, so that's six inch aperture. Um, binoculars, fantastic things. And um, basically, what she's sitting in is a computerized artisanal mount. <laughs> Just tell it where to go. <laughs> but people are now making these things. They're making them out of all manner of stuff. Um, what I've seen, it uses drills and bicycle chains, you know, so electric drills bicycle chains and some encoders on it made from mice, you know, the, the old mechanical mice. Um, uh, just ingenious, some people. Okay. Dew becomes a problem whenever you mount something, because if binoculars are just being used hanging around your neck, a lot of the time they're going to be pointing downwards, one way around, one. Um, if they're mounted, a lot of the time they're going to be used, they're going to be they're pointing upwards and dew is going to become a problem. So on these, I use a bit of what was my wife's uh, yoga mat, cheap and nasty one. I was upset at first when she saw I was going to pick it up, with a bit of Velcro on it, which goes around the, the big end like shown on there. Um, and another one on the finder, because those finders are really good dew detectors. The um, rest of the story with that is she was then delighted when she found I got her a much better quality one. <laughs> with a dead do it otherwise. <laughs> right. So that's dew. <coughs> Focusing. The binoculars that are out there, you'll notice there's two ways of focusing them. There's center focus, and there's individual eyepiece focus. Individual eyepiece focusing is generally better for astronomy. One, because you don't have to keep refocusing unless you're sharing the binoculars around. 
But secondly, um, much, much easier to make the thing dew waterproof, which means dewproof. The center focus ones, let's demonstrate on this, you have a problem with a rocking bridge. So you focus by moving the eyepieces up and down, and if they're cheap, that eyepiece bridge rocks. So as you go up against your, uh, your eye sockets, you can pop it out of focus, or you move it against your eye sockets, you can pop it out of focus. So that's just a bit of a nuisance. So, hello, it seems to have lost. Mm. Do that. Oh, yeah, great. Okay. Um, so generally, we go for individual eyepiece focusing. However, if you've got multi-purpose binoculars and you're using them for birding and for the races and everything else, then obviously center focus is, is much more convenient. Buying advice. Internet buying advice. As long as you get binoculars with back four prisms and fully multi-coated optics, you can't go far wrong. Utter rubbish. <laughs> okay. This is a selection of binoculars I had when I took that photograph. And we're going to look at those two there. They're made in the same factory, which is United Optics in Kunming in China. And if you look at what's written on them, 15 by 70, 15 by 70. Broadband FMC, fully multi-coated, fully broadband multi-coated. Back four prisms, back four prisms. How different can they be? Well, let's get lay this back four prisms to bed. Um, back four glass from the, from the from Schott AG, the German glass manufacturer, is a much it's optically denser, which means that when you get internal reflection in the prism, you get internal reflection for in, for the peripheral rays as well, and you can see that here. If you look at that there, there's a couple of little grey cutoffs there. Um, there's the same top, I just took that an angle so it makes those a little more visible. And that means that the, some of the rays from the periphery basically aren't getting through. But stuff from the middle still is. And with the back four, that's borosilicate crown, barium crown, you haven't got that. But is that the whole story? No, of course it isn't. Which has got the best stray light control of those two binoculars? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it. Uh, so, so, yeah, I've got to go for that. It's better. Well, really? Anybody into bino viewers for your telescopes, the best ones, I think, are Denkmeyer. Guess which glass they use? Better quality. Optical, and for most things. So, the back four internally reflect more light. But they're have other worse properties. But Chinese back four, and notice the difference in the way it's written, isn't even a barium crown. It's a phosphate crown glass, and the specification for that is it's allowed to have a hundred times as many, as much inclusions in it. No glass can be pure, so you have an inclusion count. And the inclusion count for this, for this stuff is a hundred times more. But Everybody said back four, so yeah, go for back four. It's complete rubbish. Um, many more important things about prisms is how they're held in. So this is a proper prism cage. Those prisms aren't going anywhere. They're, they're tightly in, they're not gonna shift. Cheap binoculars, I'll pull one apart in a bit. <coughs> I'll show you this. Could be held in by a clip. If you're lucky, it's a bit of cement underneath it, holding it, holding it in place. So we'll go. To, and they shift two images. Fully multi-coated. Well, here's the rub, folks. There's no industry-wide standard of what it means. Mm. It could be anything you want it to mean. It could mean the air glass surface of the lenses have two layers of coatings. Now, the coatings on binoculars are there for anti-reflection purposes. Or they could have all the air glass surfaces, and that includes the prism hypotenuses, could have properly applied seven layer multi-coatings, 
Which is it? You don't know. Well, that's the difference. That's those two binoculars shining a light down the same angle. One's got a heck of a lot worse reflection coming out than the other. So I think we can say that doesn't tell you anything you want to know about the quality of the binocular. But that surely got to, hasn't it? 15 by 70. Really? Um, it was set up on my kitchen table, just a laser pointer, an old finder, so I could broaden the beam, getting a parallel beam of light into there, and a very high class screen made of baking parchment. Okay, held on with an elastic band. And so I'm, this is why I don't do imaging, I'm not very good at it. And then a scale across there so I could measure the output. And what that does is it tells you the effective aperture of the binocular, how much light is coming there. 62 millimeters. That's a 15 by 70 binocular. It's got 62 millimeter actual aperture. To my mind, that's fraud. You don't have to do it like that. That's, you can just make out, that's graph paper. Just point it up at a bright sky, not the sun. Um, move the glass pa graph paper back to the forwards so if you get the tightest focus on, of that ring of light, which is called the exit pupil, onto it. Measure it, multiply it by the magnification. And that will give you approximately what the diameter is. So, using the um, laser, get 62 millimeters. Using the torch on your phone, <laughs> okay, holding it you know, sort of a few inches back, so I get 62 and a half millimeters. Exit pupil method, that one there, get just over 60 millimeters. Whatever it is, it's not 70. Uh, so that's fraud. Well, actually it isn't legally because that big end still measures 70. This is what it doesn't tell you. Don't worry about this. Um, I will give give you a, a copy of the of, of this. And all of that stuff, I would say, is probably much more important than the stuff that people sell binoculars by. And some of it you can't find out anyway. The only way you can find out if it suits you is you get the binoculars and you hold them up to your head and try them. Okay. So. That's that lot. Things to avoid, BSOs. Not BSOs, BSOs. That's a BSO. It's a binocular shaped object. <laughs> it is a, it's 80 quid's worth of utter rubbish, really. This is great, because I, I, again, doing outreach, um, I can, having shown youngsters how, just how to test binoculars. See how much you can find that's wrong with this. Well, a few little demonstrations. Uh, we need a light for the first one. And we'll do some comparisons. <laughs> right. So, so let's use some, yeah, these are binoculars as well. see the vast amount of reflection that I'm getting on the screen. Exactly. They're doing their job. See that? This is the latest ruby coatings. Could you do that again for the camera? I mistake. Oh, sorry. So this is the latest ruby coatings. Why do they do it? The most difficult coloured rays to correct for when you're correcting for colour error in optics are the ends of the spectrums, so red. So let's not bother to correct for it. Let's just get rid of it. We'll reflect it out and don't even let it get into the system in the first place. Right. The other thing is this lever here. It's a zoom lever. 
There is no such thing as a good zoom binocular. The end. Okay? Now, rubbish. If you, to make a zoom binocular that worked at the range that this thing has, um, you would, it would cost more than anybody would be prepared to pay for it. It's a gimmick, basically. Eyepiece is so, bridge is so rocky. Uh, I wrote somewhere, it's surprising that uh, Sylvester Stallone hasn't sued for intellectual property rights on that one. And then we've got the you on this. I'll show you for the camera as well. Inside there, let's just see, is a little diaphragm. That's where they start chopping the light out because the, the light that's most difficult to correct for is the edge of the cone of light. So let's just get rid of it. So these so-called 70 millimeter binoculars, let's just do a comparison. reverse light method, and we can see against there. That's the size of the light cone coming out of that. Let's do it with some proper 70s. Where did I leave them? Down here. Can you tell the difference? Mm. Those are 50s. So this is This is the sort of thing that gets touted at people who are probably to the game, or children, and it really annoys me. So what have we got? Well, we've got, I'll pass these round, and don't worry if you drop them, you can't make them worse. Um, just keep that proving wrong. <laughs> but what, what have you got? You've got two images for the price of one. Okay. <laughs> If you look at something white, you will notice it has a horrible blue-gray cast to it because all the red's gone. So it looks like you know the whole universe has become the victim of a zombie apocalypse or something. <laughs> Soft focus, which I am told, um, you get in dodgy, some dodgy sort of movie. Uh, and what else? Well, you just can't focus. They, they are complete rubbish. Who wants to go first? That did miss an interview. I'll try. There you go. Yeah. So that's and and say so zoom is absolute rubbish. So avoid zoom, avoid ruby coatings or anything else like that. It's just gimmicks, and avoid focus free, which some of them are. Focus free binoculars, which you get with um, sometimes with cheap ones. They're sort of okay for using on land. They're rubbish for the sky. What they do is they, it's called their focus, what's called the hyperfocal distance. So it's, a, it's about 70% of an infinity focus and your eyes do the rest. But they're rubbish for astronomy, really. And quick focus. By quick focus, I mean the sort of things like the Tasco Zip, where a quarter of a turn on the focus wheel takes you from a close focus of about where that gentleman there in the blue t-shirt is sitting, yeah. to infinity and beyond if you focus with a quarter of a turn you just can't you, get, you just can't get them there. you just can't get them focused at all okay so what do you look for well solar system absolutely frank binoculars are not your instrument of choice really they're not um, about the only thing they're better than a telescope for is for meteor trains. So when you know, a meteor goes over, you get the trail. You can actually watch it with binoculars, and you can watch the winds in the upper atmosphere. Sometimes for a minute and a half, two minutes, you know. So that's if you, like, if you like doing that sort of thing, that's fine. Okay. But everything else, everything else there, is much, much, much better with a small telescope, provided it's reasonable quality one, of course. But the deep sky. Bliss. So let's have a look at a, f a few examples. So large galaxy, M31. Unless I tell you otherwise, this is what I can see with a 10 by 50 in a reasonably dark sky. Um, not only can I see 
the galaxy there. You can see it's got companion galaxy. I can see that the light drops off more rapidly one side than the other side. In other words, I'm detecting the dust lane. You know, in 50 mil binos? Yeah, that's possible. Large fake galaxies, M33, um, triangulum galaxy, arguably easier in something like a 10 by 50 than a cheap telescope because you're not trying to push the magnification. It's faint. You know, you often in a telescope, you say, I can't find it. Well, you're looking straight at it. It just looks like a brightening of the sky. Okay. okay. Ah, yes. Sorry. Yes, I should have done that. Sorry. There we go. Great. Do we want to have a look at that? Companion galaxy drop off. Okay. Planetary nebulae. It's not the biggest one, apparently, from Britain. That's the helix. But the helix is so far down south that it's pretty difficult to see at the best of times. It's certainly the easiest one. Isn't it huge? <laughs> okay, so you can see large planetary nebulae. That's the Dunbar Nebula, uh, after which I've named my car. <laughs> so I think M27VUL, because it was available. Okay, globular clusters, M13, you, don't, you won't see stars with a 10 by 50, but you will notice that it looks like a big defocused star. But asterisms, that's where it comes in. This is one called Kemble's Cascade. Um, these are all north up, but in, on autumn evenings, this is vertical-ish. And it looks like a ribbon waterfall falling into a little splash pool. A little open cluster at the end. NGC 1571 or something, I could probably got it wrong, can't remember. Um, and, that, and that's lovely. Eddie's Coaster. I wish this was better known. Um, it's named for Eddie Carpenter, um, late, the late Eddie Carpenter, um, Cotswold Astronomical Society. He used to love showing this to people. This is the centre star, sometimes called Navi, I think of the W of Cassiopeia, and this is going northward. So if you get that at the bottom of the field view, there you go, just a little roller coaster of stars. Oh, yeah. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah? And Eddie's showed that, and that's now, as, far, as much as there's an official list of asterisms, Eddie's coasters of it. Eddie, he's, got, he's passed on, but he'll be remembered yeah, through, through that. And that you don't have to be called Messier or someone like that to have your own catalogue of stuff. You know, go out and look with binoculars, find things nobody else has noticed before. And, it's, it's, and you, you will. Um, or you might find somebody else has noticed it before, but you may still make an independent discovery of it. So just enjoy it. You know, there's, there's so much you can do, and, and maybe make your own little catalogue of stuff. Um, this is Colander 399, the coat hanger. Okay, lovely party piece, star party piece. Um, the open cluster, Colander 70. Who's seen Colander 70 here? I think you all, most, I'd be surprised most of you haven't. Those are the three stars of Orion's belt. This I call the cluster just about everybody's seen and nobody knows. What a shame. This is, it doesn't even fit in there. It's this beautiful, hot, blue-white stars, Lovely, so that, and you start looking at things, and you see we've got this S-shaped curve here. Yeah. And you know, so next time you look at it, you see, the, oh yeah, S, S for Steve, who shows it. No, no. it's that was a dollar spoiler. So this is the head and neck of a swan, and there's its wing there. You know, or or make whatever pictures you want of it. But it's don't just think, all right, oh God, there's the belt stars. Right, I'm going to go and look down here because that's where the, the nebula is. Spend time looking at things you wouldn't normally look at. You'll see stuff. They're really lovely. O big open clusters are an absolute delight. Um, Messier 45 is just like somebody's just sort of thrown diamonds and diamond yeah. dust onto black velvet. It's absolutely gorgeous in binoculars. For forget Seven Sisters. Or oh, coming up in summer, things like M24 Star Cloud. You know, down the southern Milky Way. About as many stars as you'll get in a single field of view anywhere in the sky. Yeah, it is just wow. 
or diffuse nebulae if this is bigger binos, and this is why I got those Miucci's, because a friend of mine had some, and I looked at them, I saw this sort of detail in the Orion Nebula, I thought, I've got to have those. <laughs> right, so where do you find out? Well, a bit of self-promotion, I'm afraid. Um, every month I write a binocular tour for Sky at Night magazine, which is just six objects to find in the night sky. The things that say they are findable with 10 by 50s, all of them I've seen with 8 by 42s. Because, and it's because of this, this, um, this shutting down of the aperture feature you get with budget binoculars. Most cheap 50 binoculars are 40, 42 ish or less. I found one that was 39, which is horrible. And all the 15 by 70s stuff, 15 by 70s, I can see with 10 by 50s. Um, my eyes aren't what they once were, so they should be okay. I, I once put something in that I could only see with 15 by 70s, and a load of people wrote in so they couldn't find it. So don't do that anymore. I also produce a thing called the Binocular Sky Newsletter, which is just freebie. You can pick it up off my website. Um, it's just what, what to look for in the sky this month. And you can subscribe and it just gets sent to you. I'm probably going to be stopping that by the end of the year. I've been doing it for about 11 years and I'm be beginning to get a bit jaded and wanting to do other things with my time. But anyways, um, it doesn't cost you anything. I have a website, Binocular Sky, and on it you can select objects by, whoops, um, your latitude, your horizon altitude, so if you've got gunge up to 20 degrees, you don't want to find stuff in there. It was really just an exercise in programming. Um, I wanted to teach myself a bit of database programming. Um, so you can choose by object type or multi-choose. Constellation, please don't tell me that there's constellations that aren't there. I know there aren't, it's because I haven't, got, I haven't put any objects for those constellations in the database yet. Or limiting magnitude, what order you want your sort criteria in and you can either search like that or and get something like this the list of things click on them or you can go onto an all sky map for month and time hover over a little dot and it tells you what it is there's also a key up there that tells you what the different colors mean um, click on it and it takes you to a page like this which shows you how to find it, so this is Kemble's Cascade, how do you find it? Well, you've got the W of Cassiopeia here, you across it, you just take that distance, that distance further on, bingo, you're there. Um, and then it'll find a chart for it, and if I've got round to doing it, um, what you'll see in different size binoculars, depending on what you put up in the, in the search bar. Um, it's about 300 objects in there, I want to get over 500, but I'm still on the green side of the turf, so there's a bit of work to do on that. Um, alternatively, um, the Excel time. A couple of books. Somebody reckons this one is the most comprehensive book on binocular astronomy they've ever read. I'm not going to uh, argue with that. Um, they're normally 35 quid. You can get it here for 25 if you want. Or this one which I wrote because people say, start with binoculars, then nobody tells you how to. So the idea of this one is there's a couple of chapters per month, and the idea is you go, you go through um, about half a dozen to a dozen objects a month, and by the time you've done that for a year, you've got a fairly good appreciation of what's visible in the sort of northern hemisphere temperate sky. So that's what those are, those are about. Um, So if you would like any of those, please do. Don't feel obliged to. I've got enough for everybody anyway. Um, and thank you for listening. And I hope you feel that you've at least learned something about binoculars and binoculars from you this evening. Um, I'm sure glad you try and take questions. Yep. Did we have one there? Okay. I've got two questions, if that's okay. Yeah. So earlier in the lecture you mentioned that you didn't like the scale, which I, which I wanted to ask more about because I used it myself and I found it quite useful. So what, using what, sorry? The Bortle scale. Yeah, some people do. I just, it, it, 
I first came across the Bortle scale when I was in my 60s. Mm. I, you know, I've been doing limiting magnitudes for, make a limiting magnitude at Zenith for heaven knows how long. You know, it's, it's just old dog, new tricks. So, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess yeah. that, I guess so. Okay. And the second question was that um, you mentioned also <coughs> that binoculars aren't really suited for solar system observation. Uh, why is that? Why are telescopes better? Because most solar system objects are really tiny. Okay. Okay, the moon's a bit different, but if, if you... I mean, people get disappointed with the size of Saturn, Jupiter, and particularly Mars, with, you know, things that magnify us you know, 100, 150 times. But it's tiny. I want to see something like you see on the, you know, in the magazine photo. Well, yes, you can't. Uh, not with that. And so it's... The, really... With 50 by 70s, good ones, I can just make out on a really good night that Saturn is a slightly odd shape, and as long as the wing rings are wide open, I can just make out sometimes that you get these little fleeting dark patches between the planet and the rings. And, and that's patience and, dare I say, a heck of a lot of experience with this sort of stuff. You know, your average person is not, go not going to do that. Um, Jupiter, yes, you can see Galilean moons. Usually you don't see the markings unless you've got really good quality optics. I pulled these things out. These are just little, um, these are freebies that um, Celeste was giving away at AstroFest. They focus by squeezing like this. <laughs> okay. And I have seen Ganymede and Callisto with these. Oh, really? Not at the same time, okay? Because <laughs> there's only one clear bit in this. Uh, you know, these are, uh, it's, it's just, and the reason I do that is because people say, oh, I, I saw, you know, I saw one of the Galilean moons with 10 by 50s. It's not a test of 10 by 50s. It's a test of cheap, shoddy plastic. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that answers my question. Present right. phase of Venus. Mm? That's the present phase of Venus. Present phase of Venus Yes, preferably the daytime, because it's easier, because it's not so bright. You don't glare it out. <coughs> but that's only the present phase. You normally can't tell that it's been lead us now. Yeah, Robin, thank you. Uh, what's your view, if you'll excuse the pun, on the stabilised binoculars? I think they are brilliant. They are Image stabilised binoculars, okay, they use various kinds of tech to basically stabilise your image. Um, some of them use gimbals. Um, Canon was one of the first ones to do them. They use things that are called a very angle prism. It's a prism that's actually liquid in it, and you can actually change the angle of the prism. Their high end ones use the same image stabilization, which is a lens shift thing that they use in their high end camera lenses. They are absolutely stunning. Okay? So I was reviewing. I, re I reviewed binoculars for Sky Night as well. Um, after reviewing one of the latest ones a couple of years back, a couple of years before, before lockdown, God, um, and the whole binocular there, tense, so you're shaking like mad to test the stabilisation. And you've got this weird thing where the sky is rock steady and the binoculars are shaking around it. Absol the Canon optics, though, well, I don't rate them so much. There's one, there's one, it's, it's a Belgian one, I think, it's called Kite Optics. The optics are much better, the stabilisation isn't as good. So, you know, you, you, one day someone will bring out the perfect one. They are absolutely fantastic. The early ones are a little bit dodgy, um, you get a little bit of swim, it doesn't quite hold it steady, so it swims around, that used to make me feel sick. Um, the, why don't I use them? Quite simply because. I can see a heck of a lot more with this, and I mean a heck of a lot more with this, than I could see with Im image stabilised binoculars that cost the same amount. And I'm a cheapskate. Okay. When I get to the stage where I can't handle this lot anymore, I'll get stabilised binoculars like a shot. But, they, but the big ones are heavy, is the other thing. The, the standard sizes are. I've got the Canon 10 by 30. Yeah. And the, I've heard it said that those are as good as 
10 by 50 ordnance binoculars yes. handheld, which yeah. probably handheld they are. And yeah, in terms of very faint objects, no, mm -hmm. but in, for, for general purposes, yeah. yes. And as you say, everything is rock steady. The, the size about that, I think, is 18 by 70, isn't it? Is it 18 by they, do, they, do a, they do a 15 by 15. Yeah. Yeah. They also do um, a, I mean, they do a load, a load of little ones. Okay, like 14 by 32 and that, which have, which have got the, the really good, but they're for birders really, they've got good stabilisation on. Um, they also do, can't remember, a something by 42, can't remember what it is. Uh, I mean, cost it well. Minor 10 by 42. That's, that's the one probably. Um, yeah, sort of, uh, probably about 1,200 quid's worth at the time or something like that. Yeah. So, you see, that, that's, that's quite a lot. That's, that's the sort of thing, and they at least are waterproof, which none of the other cannons are. He said, but we don't do it in the road. Well, we do do it. You know, if you're birding, you want, you want protection against rain, if um, astronomy obviously is due. Um, so, so yeah, uh, but those, those, those 10 by 42s, I think, I think they're lovely. You know, a friend's got one. That's probably what I'll go for when I, <coughs> when I can no longer wield those things around. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the other, at the other end, end of the scale, uh, what's your view on the co so-called constellation binoculars, the very low power Galilean but wide field? You've got a pair, I see. Yeah. Well, I've got this this one because I was offered it uh, cheap at the time. <laughs> um, this is the Vixen one. I think they're amazing. But it's a completely different look on binocular astronomy. <coughs> this is just you to, I see this as using tech to bring back what tech has taken away from us. In other words, you get about an extra magnitude, magnitude and a half with these. So it makes up a little bit for light pollution, which is great. And you don't notice the magnification. Um, what, are, one, what is the specification? Could you These are 2.1 by 42. <laughs> So they're magnified twice. Yes, <laughs> and you don't notice it. Mm. Um, they, the worst thing about these things is about the first five times you use them, you get your fingers on the lenses because it's almost impossible not to exist. <laughs> they're so narrow. <coughs> There's a, a Japanese version. In fact, one of the um, original ones called a wide bino. And that one you can buy a little helmet with it if you want to, and actually attach it to it so you can wear it. <laughs> walk, just walk around and wear it. Um, yeah, but there's now um, Orion, which, uh, which means it's probably an almost certainly a Chinese binocular factory, doing some 54 millimeter ones. What that, you've got to forget everything you thought you knew about optics and work and exit pupils and all the rest of it. Um, the field of view you get with these increases according to the size of the um, of this here. So this is essentially the same configuration as that little plastic thing I said round right at the beginning. Okay. And the closer you hold them to your eyes, the larger the field of view you'll get. Um, they are. I think they're great. And I've tried them out under a really pristine sky. Mm -hmm. um, Oli Pinrice's place down in southeast France. And under that sort of sky, God grieve that. They're <laughs> impressive. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you see stuff you've never seen before with your naked eye. It looks like you're looking with your naked eye. Love them. But they are <coughs> the only good ones. I think a good price. And people have made their own as well using, I think it's Nikon. Um, tele magnifies for lenses, two times magnifies, and 3D printing the frame to hold them in. So people made their own as well. So there's lots, but there, it's a, it's just a completely different, complete different take. Forget everything you ever thought you'd do about binocular astronomy, and this is this is just different. It's just it's enjoyable. You might wonder why they don't make one by 42 
binoculars, but the, I believe the reason is that the exit pupil will be so large, you'd need the, the eyes the size of an owl to make use of them. Well, okay. It's not so much that as the magnification effectively going the other way yeah. increases the size of your pupil. Yeah. You don't get 50 millimetres or 42 or whatever yeah. they are. You get, your, your, you get to the damage of your pupil magnified by magnified by the mag yeah. multiplied yeah. by the magnification. So if you look so at effectively those, you're looking at through ten or twelve millimeter yeah. pupils. Yeah. If you can see it up against there, and the size of those exit pupils is massive, much bigger than anybody's eye pupil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For, I say forget everything you thought you knew about this. These are they're, they're different. And the exit pupils actually inside the binoculars yeah. anyway. Because yes. Galilean. Yeah. Because the Galilean, the exit pupils between the lenses. You're never going to get your eye there. There's a question up at the back. So what made you start to be interested in binoculars? What made me get interested in them? Um, when my dad took me out to see if we could see Sputnik. And living about eight miles outside of place called Bulawayo, which is in what is now Zimbabwe. Sputnik being for the age, for the sake of oh, yeah. a young person. The first ever satellite to go into orbit. Uh, 3rd of October 1957 it was launched. And uh, under such pristine skies with binoculars, I'd never, it was the first time I'd ever actually looked at a night sky without looking at it rather than just sort of seeing it because it was there. And I was hooked from then on, and getting, because they were cruel at school in those days, getting beaten for drawing things like spacecrafts and <laughs> satellites, and then that all over, or comets all over my books and all the rest of it. You know, the, 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 sort, the sort of things you used to get into trouble for in those days, but hooked ever since. So, because I was blooming lucky, I think, is the answer to that. You know, I, I, had, I had an opportunity most people don't get. I just wanted to ask about the use of spectacles and um, binoculars. Mm. The, what would you comment about that? It depends what you're doing. Um, most of the binoculars, you'll see they've got some form of eye cup on them. So you can fold them down to use them with spectacles. Because then your eye's getting a bit closer, you can get the whole field of view. Um, if I'm just looking for stuff and enjoying it, I take them off. Because I'm not doing anything absolutely critical and I've got a layer less of glass in the way. If I'm doing something like evaluating binoculars for review or just wanting to see if I can split a double star or something like that or how close I can see one of the uh, Jupiter's moons to the disk of the planet, that sort of thing, I'll get the specs on because I'm, I'm getting something clearer. Um, my big problem with, if, if you haven't got astigmatism, you actually don't need specs, because you can focus, you can focus out short-sightedness and long-sightedness. If you've got astigmatism, that's where you, you absolutely do need specs. Um, you, but if you are short-sighted, you need to check that your, what the sort of beyond infinity focus is on the binoculars to make sure I can correct for it. Um, the only ones I've found that won't with the original Helios Stella um, 15 by 70s, they went just to infinity and hardly anything beyond. Um, so they weren't any, weren't any good for that. Um, once they made the next lot, yeah, you got past infinity folks, which, which means that people with short sight can focus on infinity. Okay, thank you. What do you use? Uh, well, I sometimes wear spectacles, sometimes I don't. Yeah. <laughs> whatever feels right at the time. Yeah. Right. Which, whatever feels right. Yeah. Exactly. yeah I, there's no hard and fast rules with this. This is this is visual enjoyment for for pleasure. You know, and whatever you find pleasurable, do it. Now, one thing you've told us is the things that the binoculars that you've experienced are the rubbish. Mm. Could you recommend any manufacturers where you can be fairly sure that if you buy their binoculars, you'll get a good buy without going up to the thousands of pounds for ah, Zeiss and all that? Okay, so we'll, we'll cut out Zeiss, Swarovski, Color, um, that lot. Um, there is going around the shop now. It's, it's same manufacturer is um, 
a bit misleading. Could I please have my... Uh, oh, no, I've got them over here. So, this is a damn good binocular. The manufacturer is the same as that, which isn't a damn good binocular. Um, so that's the that's a difference there. Which ones are those? The, so what you're looking for, I think, is you're looking for something in your budget. You are looking for something that will be supported by the the dealer in this country. And the ones I recommend, and I'm not on a commission, <laughs> no, um, are Opticrons, I have a lot of Opticron binoculars, I mentioned them earlier, because they've got damn good after sales service. So these, which are, they're not by any means the best, so these are about 80 quid's worth. Um, I think they, they also do a 10 by 50 at almost exactly the same price, so these are 8 by 42's. They're waterproof, which means they're dew proof. Um, they're backed up by a really good after-sales service. Um, Pete Gamby, the uh, sales bob at um, Opticron, you know, he he wants to do the right thing by people. They're sturdy. It's a, um, okay, it was a bit of a hiatus during lockdown, but my my set of twelve has been through. I don't know how many classrooms and scout groups, and including one little boy who I found sucking on a knife. He's <laughs> I sterilise them afterwards. No, no. Um, and they're still going pretty strong. They're robust. And I think they are probably the best value for money you will get in handheld binoculars for under about 130, 150 quid. So if you were to buy a telescope in Argos for £80, you would get pretty complete, rubbish, wouldn't you? Complete rubbish, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. Um, I don't know if they're still doing them. We, I don't realize how old I'm getting. It was about 15 years ago. I started a, going a, a thing about these blowing department store telescopes. You know, one of the ones that got Hubble Space Telescope images of stuff on the outside, and they're 60 mil, they're on a rubbish eyepieces, and they're, they magnify 625 times, and all the rest of it, which theoretically, yes. And I started a thing with the Advertising Standards Authority. Just getting people to send me adverts of these things. I'd gotten the, the nice wording right and could do it quite quickly with the ASA. And a lot of them, you might notice there's a lot fewer of them now mm. than there were yes. 15 years ago. Yeah. And what's more, you don't get the, um, the, the, what used to be called Sunday newspaper adverts or department store um, instruments, which were for telescopes which were, as you say, advertised as uh, 600 magnification and all that sort of thing, which were because they put in a three times Barlow made out of Corona bottle. And um, they, they would magnify that amount, but you would just see the moon looking like a, 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 a sort of pearl, um, lots of colours, but no actual detail. Yeah. And I, I looked, I've been looking, looking for ads for those things, and they don't do them no. now. So I'm glad to hear that the... Uh, yeah. The binocular. There was one again, a Sunday newspaper advert for Zoom binoculars. They were about. They went up to a hundred times, didn't they? Do you remember those? I forget yes. the, name, the trade name. But the idea. They said ideal for astronomy. <laughs> well, you'll notice those Zoom ones. Anyone found a brand name on them? No. No. Well, would you want your name on it? <laughs> 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 and that, I mean, they, those are. I can't remember what the magnification is, up to 60 times or something like oh, that. Com yeah, complete tosh. But no, they're, they're, you can do a lot better with low end. You know, start, with, start with binos. There's, so there's, uh, even with little ones like this, there are hundreds of objects you could see with these. And a lot of them you'll see a lot better than you will with a, with a cheap and nasty telescope costing the same amount. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much indeed, Steve. That's been, I've learned a lot, and I'm sure you have as well. And so, thanks very much, Steve Conkin, for that. Thank you very much for inviting me, Robert.
Let me give you the little microphone. Yes. If I will now, in the absence of our, I'll, I'll need it on actually. Um, in the absence of our observations director. <laughs> Who is David Arditti? I'm get now going to. Do, oh, good! It's come up on the screen. That uh, took me some time to work out. Um, I will now do the uh, observation, and we have got a lot to show you. Is this coming through? Try again. Um, I think I switched it off. Oh, that's more like it. Yeah. Okay. And before you do that, yeah. I say I'm. Um, I'll hang around, so if anybody wants to ask a question about binos or anything like that, I'll be around to answer stuff. Yes, and you, you're welcome to uh, play with the parallelograms as well, which is a, a treat. I don't think, I don't know, I haven't looked outside recently, I don't know if we've got any clear sky, but uh, uh, probably best to leave them in here. Yeah. They tend to fall over if you try to move them when they're... Martin's arrived at the end of the lecture in the This is a record. <laughs> right, okay. Observations and sky notes. Um, that's the only bit. Well, David has put together the. Oh, yeah, let me scribble that round. Okay, that's it. Good. David has put together the, the presentation, and I've added a few that people have sent more recently. So let's we'll crack on. I'm going to start with a photograph taken by Trevor last August. You'll see the date down here. 26th of August 2022. Now, you might need to uh, look quite carefully at this. Over here on this side is the planet Venus, and over there, can you see the crescent moon? Yes. Now, that's quite a rare sight, really. Not Venus, because that, as you know, has been in the sky quite a lot. But this was taken actually before Venus went behind the sun, which it did um, uh, just. Um, about about uh, last November, and this was taken in the dawn sky. So there was the there was the moon rising as a crescent, um, but it was taken about 27 hours before um, before the actual moment of new moon. So the, the this is quite unusual to see the crescent moon within 27 hours of of new, and that was a. A rare observation made by Trevor. You need a good sky and a low horizon to be able to do that. But Venus has, of course, been in the sky much more recently. And here's another one he took, which was. Let me just bring the lights down now. Which was more recently. And this one. Could you stay this side, sir? Oh, yeah, okay. And this was taken on the uh, 4th of April, uh, 10th of, uh, of April. And there's Venus alongside the Pleiades. And there's the details up the top. And this was using a, a standard compact camera. Nothing DSLR, nothing very clever. Um, but um, that's the sort of thing you can do with a standard camera. Now, here's one of David's. And this was actually taken on the 29th of April. And this is, of course, Venus through his... 356, that's 14, uh, 14 inch uh, Schmidt Cassin ring. And these are pictures taken through different, inf different filters. This is an infrared filter, 807 nanometers, well into the infrared. And then this is a red filter, blue, ultraviolet, and there's a false color version. Now you can see that the, <coughs> it, it's rather interesting, he can see a little bit of detail using the infrared filter. But then when you get to the ultraviolet, although it's a very blurry image, and he told me the reason for that, you can actually see some detail on Venus, which is a bit more contrasty. So he got more contrast in the ultraviolet than he did in the, uh, in the infrared there. Um, but the reason he says it's so blurry is because he took this through a Schmidt-Cassegrain telescope and it's not corrected for, um, for use in the ultraviolet. So those are pictures of, uh, of Venus on the 29th of April, and here they are on the 1st of May. Again, the same sequence. And as you can see there, the, uh, info, the uh, ultraviolet image has got detail on, on Venus. If you look at Venus with the naked eye, uh, rather, with the naked eye through a telescope, you won't see any markings at all. Very difficult to see any markings at all. Martin, has also, Martin Lewis has also been photographing 
Venus in the ultraviolet. And this was taken with his 4.4 mm 18 inch Dobsonian um, with a ASA 462mm camera. And it shows an amazing amount of detail. Martin, are you here? Yeah. 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 Would you like to comment? Uh, yeah, so that's taken in the UV again. Um, so working in the UV is uh, the best way to see contrast in the cloud details. And at the moment, Venus is very active in, uh, in uh, there's a lot of structure in the clouds in uh, ultraviolet light at the moment. Some very unusual things going on. Any, any idea why that should be? Though I thought Venus was fairly yeah, sort of standard. Yeah, they don't know. They don't know. There's some very large uh, features um, in the atmosphere and turbulent features that are visible and they've not been seen before. And this was taken on the 7th of May, so ongoing activity. And of course yeah. Venus is very well placed for observation. Yeah. Here's another one. Oh, sorry, it's just the... Uh, wow. Um, uh, that's, that's the 17th of April. That's with my smaller scope. That's like a three quarter inch. Yeah, even with a, an eight and a half inch. Yeah, that was a better, a better night than yeah. the night before, so I actually saw more than with the larger scope. You, you would not believe that was Venus, really, would you? No. Um, and yet, ultraviolet within, um, what was the, uh, what, what, uh, what, what, what wavelength is that? That's UV again. Yeah, well, do you, you don't know the exact number, 360 or something like right? uh, that? It's a band um, from about 320 up to right, 380, yeah. something like that. It's a VARDA, it's yeah. a VARDA cellar Venus filter specifically for that so it's hard. So it's a fantastic image. And, and Mars, if I'd taken a picture of Mars like that at opposition, I'd be very pleased. Mm. But this was taken by Martin on the 19th of April, when the planet is, was only 5.7 seconds of arc across. And it shows a fantastic amount of detail. Oh, and what's the moment? Is that a polar cap there? That's the yeah. Yeah. North polar cap. cap. And then Sirtis Major on the left, that wedge-shaped area. Yep. With Hellas, that uh, <coughs> lighter patch right at the top. Now that was taken, you might notice the phase there. And I've put on this diagram here. And then a very considerable phase on, on Mars there. You normally see Mars, certainly at opposition, it is a complete disk. But notice the phase on that, on that view there. And that's because it's a quadrature. In other words, a quadrature, it is when it is at right angles to the line between the Sun and the Earth. And so the Sun is coming at it from the side and you actually do get a considerable amount of, of phase showing. Um, but when it moves further around there, um, the, the, this is, this is uh, a static view with the, the Sun and the Earth fixed and Mars moving around the, the, the pair of us. But as it moves a bit further around in its orbit, we'll be going that way, sorry, um, then it will get more, the sun more full onto it, and so that phase will disappear. This was a phase of, of 0 .8, uh, 0 .897, I think it was. Oh, I can't see it there, but there's a considerable phase anyway. Now we're moving on to pictures taken at uh, the, deep, the, the site in uh, Mid Wales, Lanahintha which was a week, a Wallace weekend from the 24th of April to um, the, the weekend of the 24th of April. And this is the merry crowd that attended. I'm not among them. If you want to book for next year's event, look on the website and, and book up straight away because it gets booked up very quickly. Last year it was booked up before we had a chance to announce it. So um, I'm afraid that, 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 those, that, that game there are the ones who were in the know. But are there still places do we know, Martin? I think there are a few places, but yeah, do phone up very soon. And the it is uh, what's the weekend next year? Um, oh, it says there next week, third to the sixth of May, twenty twenty four. So it may be the last time you you get warning of when it's going to take place. And as you can see, the the site uh, well, there are clouds, but it is well away from the street lights, and um, a very special event occurred this year which has never occurred on 
uh, it has occurred to one on previous uh, trips to deep wet to uh, mid Wales, but not on uh, not at this site, which is this, the Aurora. This was taken by Juan Man, and this was the 23rd to 24th of April, and just a straightforward wide-angle lens photograph, and you can see the the very obvious red colour. More often than we get the aurora looking green, if there's a bit of a glow it's usually greenish, but on this occasion it was very strong. It was also, the centre of it was well to the north, but it was so strong that we got the red uh, appearance of the upper atmosphere, uh, and of, 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 of light from the upper atmosphere, where the aurora is red. So it was a fantastic sight for those who were there. And there's another one from Quang Man, and to me, if, if, I look, if I had that picture, I'd say, oh, light pollution again. No, that was the aurora. And there's another one. I know one of these is a, is a time lapse. I think if I press the button, maybe I'll need to use the mouse for this. Well, I'll just try to pick in, see if it plays. Oh, yes, there we go. Those are, of course, from ordinary clouds. But you can see the very slow rotation of the sky there. And what looked like meteors going across are not, of course, they're just planes. So, I don't know if I can repeat that now. Um, oh, there we go. Not much activity in the aurora on that time lapse, but as you've seen, it did, did change in appearance from time to time. There. Okay, and this one by Trevor, and you, you like this because of its uh, quite ghostly appearance, like some sort of spirit looming out of the sky. But the, the colour shows up very strongly there. Oh, and there's another one. Let's make sure I press the right button. And really striking colour in that shot, again taken with the DSC, Sony DSC H, H, HX90, which is uh, a small compact camera, no DSLR, uh, a basic zoom compact camera. Yes, Trevor? Pretty much, the, the zoom is quite tremendous. Yeah, I like Sony zoom things as they are. I've had some very good pictures from Sony zoom compact cameras. And here's another pair that uh, Trevor did. The, um, the, the one is the sky. The same part of sky pretty well in 2022, nice black sky, bright sky caused by the aurora in 2023. And again, you might think that was light pollution, but no, that was the aurora. The, uh, the sky we're looking at here, there's the... Uh, basically bellows. Yes, so that's... Uh, so, so that's... Um, uh, oh, oh, and, and there's the constellation, oh, I've seen the constellation of Woking there. Um, Carni Venetici there, Carni Venetici there, Arcturus and Boetius there. Wow. And here's one like one man wow. using a, a, the, his 14mm lens again, but it's five frames stitched together showing the Milky Way quite low at this time of year, but a lovely panoramic view. He used a 14mm Samyang f2.8 lens and 20 second exposures. And that's a fantastic photograph. And there's a single frame again with the, uh, and this is a time lapse, so if I press the button again, there we go. Milky Way rising over in the east. Sometimes when you see that in the dark sky, you think, oh, here come the clouds. No, it's a Milky Way. Mm -hmm. Is that another one? Yes. <laughs> As dawn approaches, I think. Okay, now. And here's one by one man taken with a through his 70 millimeter uh, ED refractor and a Canon 100D camera. 
uh, total exposure of 57 minutes in 90 second subframes from the Van der Kinder. And there's another one. Now this is again by Kwong Man, same combination, and it's Markerian. He was aiming for Markerian's chain in Virgo, but he missed it. It's off, the, off to this side, I think, or one side or the other. Um, but nevertheless, it's scattered with galaxies, and this is where a small refractor comes into its own, showing a wide field of view, and you can get just dozens of galaxies in the field of view. Uh, and that's, uh, that's an amazing shot. You need dark skies for that sort of thing. And there is M81 and M82, again with that 70mm refractor and a 100D Canon camera from down to down. Now, you might think that this was taken with a DSLR camera. It's not. It was taken by Lee Spencer, again from Turner Hither, and it's with a, uh, a five inch Celestron, uh, or five, yeah, five inch Celestron Schmidt Cassegrain telescope with a 32 millimeter eyepiece pointing his mobile phone into the eyepiece. And he and it's got a night vision. Device. Well, night vision, right. The night vision device, the OVI. Uh, right. And so that's a combination of 35 eight second frames, total of eight, eight minutes exposure. And I've, it's the first time I've seen someone do this, I'm sure people have tried it before, but you can show us you can nowadays get some pretty good photographs, even using a mobile phone of, of vision. Look, it was a Huawei P20 mobile. So not even a not even an iPhone. <laughs> it's usually iPhones that uh, people go to for for that sort of thing using Nightcap, which is the app that people use on an iPhone. But um, with this, it's uh, a Huawei. Amazing shot from a mobile phone of M3. Now at the other end of the cost scale, shall we say, an amazing photograph by John Davies. This was not from Tanahintha, not from the deep skies of Mid Wales. It's actually from South Ealing, with skies pretty much as good as you would get even in South Harrow. And it's of the Christmas tree and cone nebula. That's the cone nebula there. The Christmas tree cluster is, you, you can't see it, there's a good group of stars in there. But look at the amount of nebulosity. How does he do it? The answer is he uses a a 3 nanometer narrow band H alpha filter and he's using a what's uh, called a radiant raptor refracting telescope 61 millimeter aperture not long ago people thought why bother with a 60 millimeter refractor you can't see anything through it but photographically and we're not talking about cheap telescopes here we're not talking about the the, the Tasco 60 millimeter telescopes that you used to be able to buy for silly prices but this the, the telescope itself cost about 1600 pounds but that is because it gives very high quality images and with the um, you can see it's got edge to edge definition here and it's using a three nanometer hydrogen alpha filter just looks at the light of hydrogen alpha cuts out pretty well all the light pollution which is how he's, he's able to manage that from South Ealing. And of course the guiding and everything else is spot on mm -hmm. because the total exposure time there was two hours and five minutes. And here's another one of his, again from South Ealing, of the what's called the Elephant Trunk Nebula, which is that bit there, of the whole nebula being NGC, uh, sorry, sorry, IC 1396 in Cepheus. And again, two hours, five minutes exposure, from South Ealing, and he's now put colour on that by simply adding the, uh, a red filter to the nebula and leaving the stars white. So that's a fantastic looking image from our neighbourhood, which uh, I, I'm amazed that he can do that sort of thing. It just goes to show what can be done. And before we leave the subject of photography, we've got, I wanted to plug this event. I've got some leaflets here on the the desk which is taking um, place next Sunday the 21st of May. I've got a personal interest because I'm speaking at it 
so I make no apologies for plucking it. I don't make any money out of it, I should say. It's um, self-financing. It's a one-day course in Northampton on astrophotography, starring Dave Eagle, Mary McIntyre, who have both spoken to this society, and me, and it will run through astrophotography, all aspects of it, in one day. A lot of talking. And so that's as neat as there. Ten pounds for SBA and BAA members, or twelve pounds to uh, anybody else. So uh, here's, here's the link. Leaflets that's coming up next Sunday. Now, oh, amazing, gone again. Anyway, well, let's, let's not worry about the, uh, the slideshow. Sky highlights, I've just got a few minutes for these now. Um, the phases of the moon, the last quarter of this last, uh, last um, uh, you know, three days ago on the 12th of May. So we've got new moon coming up on the 19th, 19th of May. And of course, it's, we've got high pressure which is usually good because we've got cloud coming over every night but nevertheless you may be lucky and get some clear nights and so the new moon and dark skies over the next week or two and then the first quarter is on the 27th of May and the full moon on the 4th of June by which time the skies are bright anyway with getting towards midsummer so uh, you've got a double whammy and unless there are noctilucent cloud to be seen looking into the north uh, you might as well give up on astronomy around the beginning of June and then last quarter on the 10th of June, which is just before our next meeting. And um, the next thing, I was going to do a quick run through of the sky. Let me see if I can do it, because we don't have much time left. Using solarium. Yes, there we go. Right, that's the sky as it is now. And what I wanted to do was just show you what's in the western sky. There we have Venus looking a bit bright on the Stellarium view. But also notice that Mars is, so we've got Venus here, and Mars is still in the sky, looking very small now. Um, but it, it is really a tiny object, only, um, only a fraction of the size of what it was when it was at opposition. So what I'm going to do is just quickly run through what happens over the next few nights. Let me just fix this for time. So that's this time of night, 10 o'clock, when the sun has gone down, and if it's green, we'll see by Venus, you can't miss it in the sky at the moment. So what's going to happen over the next month? As you see, Venus is actually staying more or less at the same height above the horizon. Uh, here comes the moon. That is actually a, a crescent moon. That The date now is the... 21st of, June, of May, and that's a crescent moon, but the way star Starling represents it, it, it it's, it's very bright there, it's really a crescent. But you'll notice that Venus is actually getting lower in the sky now, instead, although it's moving farther away from the Sun, what's happening is that the line of the ecliptic, the line of the, where the Moon, Venus and Mars and the other planets um, follow, is actually reducing in angle to the water horizon. So the net result is that Venus gets lower and lower instead of higher in the sky and farther away from the sun. So let's just move a few more days and we'll see what happens. There goes the moon and that's now the 24th of May. Now as we move further on into June you'll notice that Venus and Mars get closer together but you see the reducing angle of the ecliptic in the sky. The net result being that Venus actually gets lower. So if you want to get a look at Venus through a telescope, do it pretty soon. And by about, I think it's the 2nd of June, which is, now that's for the 15th of June. Let's bring it up a bit. I think it's about the, uh, the first few days of June. Venus is at half phase dichotomy. And then after that, it gets larger and larger. But normally we'd expect to be able to see it in the evening sky uh, as, uh, as we were saying earlier on, with binoculars as a thing present. But as it does that, uh, we, it just gets so low in the sky. And so I'm afraid we lose Venus towards the end of June and also Mars. You will hardly see Mars at all. Uh, we don't have any more time for any more sky notes, but uh, the only other planet of any significance around at the moment would be Saturn and you have to get up in the fairly early morning to be able to see that 
uh, about three in the morning, low in the south. So not much by way of planets at the moment, but being summer, we can look forward to those, perhaps those noctilucent cloud um, in, the, in midsummer looking northwards, which are actually high altitude atmospheric phenomena, but nevertheless they are a very pretty sight. And also there is still the possibility of seeing the northern lights. The sun is becoming more active at the moment. And as we know, the weather forecast often features explanations uh, or, or forecasts of the uh, appearance of the, of the aurora. Keep an eye on spaceweather.com and there are other uh, aurorawatch.lanx.ac.uk I think is a good one to try. Just put in Aurora Watch into a search engine and that will tell you what the auroral activity is as seen in the UK at any time. So with that, uh, end of the meeting. Our next meeting is the annual general meeting. I think it's on the 12th of June, Monday the 12th of June, at our other meeting place in Uxbridge. And as well as the annual general meeting, which we talk about what's going on and you get a chance to raise questions and quiz, quiz the uh, treasurer. Um, incidentally, we've, we're, we're in, in good shape treasurer-wise uh, mm. at the moment, or money-wise, so um, some good news there. But also, we have Sue and Tim, who have been just returned from Australia. And I'm glad to say, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler, to say that they have seen the eclipse. Say so they will be describing their trip to Australia to see the sky there and the eclipse of 20th of April. And that will be at the next meeting at, at Oxbridge. So look forward to seeing you there. Uh, before, thanks again. Before you close, yeah? can I just mention David Ardissian, my event, which is coming up in a few days' time? I, I sure, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I'll put the yeah. on. Uh, okay, um, every three months, uh, David Ardissi and I uh, have an observing session at uh, Box Tree Park uh, at uh, Harrow Weald. And uh, the next one will be on Friday, the 26th of May, at 9 o'clock in the evening. And we do that in conjunction with the Friends of Roxbourne Park. So the idea there is that basically people with a general interest in astronomy, but without any specialist knowledge generally, will come along and we will point out the major things in the sky. Uh, Trevor, I'm sure, will be coming along to help as well. So you're very welcome to come. So that's on uh, Friday the 26th of May at Box Tree Park, which is sometimes also known as... Uh, Harrow World Recreation Ground, right next to the bus garage, and uh, we'll be meeting there at uh, nine o'clock. So do come along if you if you'd like to. Um, one Thank other, you. One other quick announcement I, I've just remembered. John Davies, who took those fantastic narrow band images that I showed you there, has offered to do a tutorial for members. We have yet to figure out a way of doing it on how he achieves his results and. Uh, goes into something of the background of the sort of sensors you should use and the cameras and the um, and the uh, combination of telescope and camera and he's willing to do a tutorial for that so for members probably not in a full meeting but we'll need to fix out a way to fix, fix a way of doing it so if you would like to take part in that please let me know Paul uh, sorry, I'd sorry, like to point out for about the next week we've got the International Space Station and it's going to be tonight at 22.39, 66 degrees. All right. So, so weather permitting, of course. Yes. Go to heavens above for all the times. Right. So, um, Martin, you had something quick? I'm not surprised Jim didn't mention this, but there's a Hampshire Scientific Society talk on climate yesterday, today, and in the future on Thursday. So it, was, uh, yeah. so it was taking place not yesterday, today, and tomorrow, but, uh, but on Thursday. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Is that correct, Jim? Okay, thank you. Any other? Um, the bar now has beer. The beer is back on in the bar. It wasn't on. I didn't, I didn't know it wasn't on. But. Okay, and you're welcome to take drinks in there and also respect the doctors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.